Amen. All right, so now uh, we're in Ephesians, but, but do this. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 12. We're actually, we're going to start, uh, we'll start this morning in, in Romans uh, chapter 12. Uh, but in Ephesians, we're, um, we're looking at the church, really, uh, and the first three chapters of Ephesians, uh, looking at the at the doctrine of the, the doctrine of redemption. Really, I thought the first three chapters were really about the doctrine of redemption, because of course, without redemption, there is no church. Uh, you have to be uh, redeemed to be become a a member, uh, a part of the the church of Jesus Christ that is on the earth today. Uh, here today, we're here together because we are a part. We're not just a part of. Marmaduke First Baptist Church. We're part of the uh, of the global church, this this uh, universal church, and, and this this uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, the church that uh, uh, is is all over the world. And it's, it's throughout, uh, through a large part of time, you know, in Acts, he, he established the church here in the New Testament, the New Testament church, which was a, a bit of a, it was a mystery to the Old Testament. They had no idea what was coming. Uh, but in the New Testament, uh, under, the, under the New Covenant, uh, God created this thing called the church that we are a part of uh, that is continuing today. It's very important, and we need to understand as Christians, New Testament Christians, what is this thing called the church and how? How do I fit into it? How am I part of this thing called the church? And so in Ephesians, that's really what we're looking at, especially when you get to uh, chapters 4, 5, and 6, to me, really talking about the application of the church. What what should this thing look like? What should a, a church look like? And so we've been looking at there in Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 4, uh, uh, Paul calls them gifts. Uh, now by... And, and which is a good word because they are, they are gifts. They they are not. We don't produce them ourselves, uh, but they are provided to us uh, through God through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and basically, the gifts are the are the functioning of the Holy Spirit through us as people uh, in the church. And it's our functioning. It's what we do. It's, it's how this thing works uh, and when we talk about those gifts. And so if you remember in the last couple of weeks we've been looking at there in Ephesians chapter 4 a list of those those gifts uh, and, and, and how they work in, in the body. And we're going to continue in actually in Romans chapter 12 Paul, can, he has another set uh, of gifts. There's, there's at least three places in the New Testament where Paul talks about and he describes these gifts that should be working within the, within the church. Now, one thing you'll notice is in each of these sets, none of, none of them are exhaustive. They're not, he's not saying, all right, here are all the gifts that should be functioning in the church uh, with the idea, well, you need to pick one of these gifts, I guess. That's not really the way he approaches it. And actually, each time he talks about the gifts, uh, uh, some of them overlap, but a lot of them are different. Uh, he talks about different types of gifts, and, and some, a lot of times you can kind of tell he's talking about a different aspect of the church. In Ephesians, you know, he's talking about uh, apostles and prophets and evangelists uh, and pastors and teachers. Uh, he's talking about those um, uh, overseers uh, of the church, those, those, those positions in the church. You know, to me, those were the ones who had a, a, a certain position in the church. Uh, but today, here in Romans, he's talking about, he's, he's broadening that, and we're looking at the gifts that should be taking place uh, in the church. So look at Romans chapter 12 there. Uh, let's start at verse 3. Let me find it myself. Let's read uh, uh, Romans chapter 12. Let's read 3 through 8 here. Uh, and he says this, he says, For I say, uh, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Now you remember we talked about, remember uh, uh, he, uh, Paul talks a lot there in Ephesians about unity. That uh, to be a part of the church, the church needs to have unity. That, we're all, that we all come together in unity. Uh, but then 
it, 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 he really gets into um, uh, taking that, that unity uh, and, and, and it's spreading out and having all kinds of different functions uh, within that unity. So here in, in verse 4 he says, For as, as uh, we have many members in one body, how many bodies do we have? One body. There's one body. We're under Jesus Christ, this body, this thing called the church. And all members have not the same office. Then in verse 5 he says, So we being many are one body in Christ. Very important. We are not just a body. We are not a, we are not a social group. We are not a civic organization. We are a body in Christ. Without Christ, the church does not exist. Uh, we're, we have no function. We are, all, we are under Christ. That's the only, he is the one who creates. He's the boss, we said, I believe it was a week or two ago. He's, he's the boss. All right? He's the one that's over this thing. And every one members one of another. We're all part of this thing. All right? Verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And let's read through verse 8 and then we'll come back. Verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhort exhortation uh, he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness so here Paul is giving a, a different set you know he's talking about a different set of gifts that should be taking place uh, in the church now when I and keep in mind when I say taking place in the in the church I don't I'm not saying well okay here's the here's the list we we've got to find uh, uh, you know what which of these uh, of these gifts do we need to put on brother kim you know that okay now brother kim now here's here's basically here's what it's saying a pastor is supposed to be doing and so uh this is your these are your job duties and you should go do that absolutely not that's not what uh he's saying remember last week we looked there in ephesians where it says uh the, the, these uh, those those five gifts that we looked at are for the equipping of the saints they're th to equip us to do these things these are things that you and i should be doing uh inside the church uh, as it is given to us individually as that gift from the holy spirit to, to function in these ways so let's take a look at this group here in verses six seven and eight here in ephesians or here in romans uh these gifts that he's referring to all right, so verse 6, he said, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Now remember, we've talked some about uh, prophets and prophecy. Prophecy in the New Testament is, you know, um, and I, I think prophecy, um, um, our, our understanding of prophecy, we tend to think of prophecy as foretelling. You know, that that's, that's, that's foretelling. Now don't get me wrong, you go into the Old Testament and was there some, some uh, prophets when they would give prophecy that had to do with foretelling? Yes, they did. Absolutely. They did some foretelling. In the New Testament, we're, we're talking about forthtelling, not foretelling, but foretelling. And really, when you think about it, when you think about those Old Testament prophets, what were they doing? They were, they were foretelling. And, and how was that happening? God was giving them a message. God would speak to them and say, here's what I need my people to know, and I want you to go tell them. All right? And that's what those prophets would do. Now, was there an aspect of that that some, from time to time it was, forth, uh, it, was, it was foretelling? Yes, it was. But, for, but really, when you think about the function, what they were doing, that prophecy was, was foretelling. It was God giving that, that person a message and that person going and taking it to, to whoever it was that God wanted it given to. All right. Now, in the new Te now what we have in the New Testament uh, that is is so valuable that they did not have is we have the Word of God right here. I, you know, uh, God has given us His Word, and so what He expects us to do uh, in the New Testament prophecy, we are to take His Word and we are to forth tell it we're to talk about it all right now uh and we have to be careful here sometimes you know we think when we think of prophets and prophecy you know we tend to think oh oh man you're getting into some <laughs> some deep stuff there now you know i don't i i'm not a prophet i don't i don't i don't prophesy well yes we do uh, anytime we get together as fellow christians and this is something that we should be doing uh is getting together and talking about the word of god that, hey, what, what has God been telling me? 
you know, what, what has God been showing me in His Word as I study His Word, as I pray? What are things that God is really, that are jumping off those pages that He's really speaking to me? And as Christians today, we should be getting together and we should be talking about those things. Say, hey, you know, I found this and this is, this is where God's leading me and this is what I'm dealing with and this is what God is showing me. And then on the other, yeah, hey, you know, that's a good point. And here's what God is showing me. We should be doing those things. That is, that is a gift that has been given to us uh, through, through the Holy Spirit, and we should be using those. So we have to be careful. You know, sometimes I think uh, in the New Testament church these days, uh, there are certain things in the Bible that, that give us the heebie-jeebies, and we're just, well, I don't, I don't even want to think about that, I don't even want to talk about that. Well, you know, prophecy, it's very simple, all right? It's just foretelling. It's getting together and talking about those things. Now, are there, t- uh, you know, when, when Brother Kim gets up in front of us on Sunday morning, or it could be an evangelist coming in, you know, is that abs- a forth telling to the church? Absolutely. That's part of it. Uh, but, and, and Kim was talking about, I think it was last week, he was talking about lay renewals. You know, I remember uh, uh, when I was young participating in those lay renewals. And in those lay renewals, you know, that was just, uh, it was interesting. It was people from other churches and people from our church would go to other churches. And it wasn't the, the pastor, uh, it wasn't the ordained members of the church. It was just the laymen, all right, the lay people getting together and talking to each other and saying, man, here's what God's been showing me and I want to tell you about it. And so that, there, that should be going on in the church today uh, probably more than it does. Uh, verse 7, uh, it says, Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Now, ministry, uh, again, if we're not careful, we get this idea, well, Brother Kim is the minister. He's the one who does the ministering. No, ministry means service. Uh, it's just service that we provide to, to each other uh, and to our communities through Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. That is that service. Now, it's interesting the way it's worded here. It says, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Now, that word wait, to me, uh, you know, uh, when I go to a, a restaurant, uh, the person that comes and takes my orders, either a waiter or a waitress, uh, but they are, they are waiting on me. Uh, I am the, uh, um, um, they're, they're concentrating on my needs. You know, they're coming to me. What do you, what do you need? What would you like to have? Do you need this? Do you need that? They're, 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 they're serving me and they're waiting on me. And here it says, so if, if your gift is ministry or your gift is to serve others, uh, then, then wait on our ministry. Put effort into that. Think about that. What should that service look like you know when when a uh when i'm in a restaurant and a waiter or a waitress comes to me there are certain things you know that they that they're going to make sure that they're taken care of and when we serve one another we should be thinking about those things what are the things in service to each other that we should definitely be taking care of and making sure you know making sure that we're okay that that within the body of christ and i'll say this and we're, we'll talk more about this later uh but is when we think about ministry, is there a ministry that this church has <clears throat> outside these walls to people who never stepped foot in this church uh, out in our community in the name of Jesus Christ? Absolutely, there is. And, and, but w- that's what we tend to think of, all right? And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Is that part of our ministry? Absolutely, it is. <clears throat> but I think a part of our ministry, of our service, that we really need to stop from time to time and think about is within the church, all right? I, I, do, do, I have a, do we have a ministry to people outside of this church? Absolutely. But we have a very important ministry to people right here in this church. You know, Kim has mentioned it before, uh, and, and, and I have, uh, uh, I guess, begun to pay more attention to it within our church it's, it's amazing how many new people come into this church. You know, it seems like every Sunday there's people in this church, new people that I've never seen. But here's the interesting thing. But our, our numbers, you would think if we're all these new people are coming in, well, our numbers would have to be growing. But they're not. Well, if that's the case, that means if new people are coming in, there must be people leaving, all right? And I think as a church, sometimes we don't, and I don't, you know, I just come to church and, and too often I just sit in my seat and, and, you know, and look around and there, hey, there's old Bob and there's Sally and there's Sue and hey, it's good to see you, you know. And, but there's people, there's people right here in our class that, that haven't been here in a while, 
And, you know, we should be ministering to them. We should be serving them, checking on them. And so a, a, as a church, those are things uh, that, that we need to be doing. And we're, we're going to talk more about that in, when we talk about the table of showbread uh, when we get to that. But, but definitely serving and waiting on each other within the church and taking care of each other's needs. Uh, and then in, in verse 7 says, or, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching, and we talked about teaching last week, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Now, in my Bible, uh, it gives a, a kind of a, a definition here of exhortation. Here's what it says on exhortation. It says, exhortation is the God-given desire, ability, and power to proclaim God's word in such a way that it touches the heart, conscience, and will of the hearers, stimulates faith, and produces a deeper dedication to Christ through separation from from the world, exhorting, lifting, uh, uh, um, you know, here um, the, the ability to, to uh, fire people up and exhort the, the, the word of, uh, of God. Now, uh, J. Vernon McGee, in, in his definition of exhortation, um, uh, is, is interesting. It's a little bit different. His definition of exhortation has to do with lift, uh, it, you know, here exhortation is talking about lifting up, and it, but it seems to be it's talking about lifting up the word of God and firing, you know, so that people really hear it and, and are lifted up by it. Uh, and that's absolutely a form of exhortation. But J. Vernon McGee was saying, but there's that one-on-one -on -one exhortation that some people are very, they have that gift of lifting up each other, you know, especially when they're down. You know, do you, do you know, and I, I don't, uh, so far God hasn't, I don't think he's given me this gift. I'm not very good at it. But there are those people who, who, when you're down, you just like to talk to those people. I, I mean, they, they're very, they're exhort, they lift you up. They have that ability to, to lift you up, to make you feel better. And so those are those Christians who can come and, and, ex, and give us one-on-one -on -one exhortation. And there are some of you here who have that gift, uh, that ability. And so we need to be using that ability within the church, that gift of exhortation, of lifting each other up. Uh, or, so he that exhorteth on exhort he that giveth let him do it with simplicity now my bible and giving it says uh, giving is the god-given desire ability and power because one has resources above the basic needs of life to contribute freely to one's personal possessions uh, to the needs of god's work or people so the the gift of guilt giving and it's interesting and it says do it with simplicity now first of all when we talk about giving uh, within the church, we, we don't talk a lot about giving, and, and, and you got to be careful. People get upset when you talk about tithing and giving and that type of thing. Now, I'm just going to tell you, uh, um, uh, here's my, the way I see it. Uh, the Bible uh, gives the, the 10% uh, to me. Now, you can look at that and you can say, well, that's Old Testament. And that, but, you know, to me, I don't know. The Bible, that's, that, that seems like a pretty good guide to me. That, that is a guide that has worked for me. Uh, I like, you know, years ago I came across the idea, the 80-10-10 rule. And the 80-10-10 rule is you live off of 80% of your income, take 10% of your income and save it, take 10% of your income, and that should go into the church. That should go into the work of God. I, I, I mean, I absolutely uh, believe that. And I will say, now... Uh, I, I, again, I'll have to confess, when I got married, uh, I, you know, I can't tell you that that was something that was, which when, when I got married, we were poor as dirt, you know, it's not like, you know, 10% didn't add up to much then, but I'll say this, when I got married, I was very fortunate, I married a woman who, t who said, before we got married, look, if I'm going to be married to you, this is the way this is going to work, we're going to give 10%, and we're going to give 10% uh, right off the top. That 10% right off the top, off of our gross, that's going to go to God, and then we're going, to, we're going to live on the rest of it. And we've done that throughout our marriage, and I've got to tell you, it has worked well. I mean, God has taken care of us. I'm not saying there's not been times that have been difficult, but God has blessed us through that to where that... Um, uh, he, he's taking care of our needs, all right? He's gotten us through. When I look back on, on our lives and, and those difficult times, man, I look back and I think, God, you, you have been faithful. You have been faithful to me, and I believe we need to be faithful to him. And so, so when we talk about the, 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 uh, the gift of giving, you know, but I believe we can go above that. You know, that, that 10% to me, should just that's just automatic, all right? That's just God's money, all right? That's not my money, that's his, I'm going to give it to him. But then, 
then, I, then that 80% or that 90%, you know, that's where that gift of giving comes in, that where we should find ways to, uh, to give. And, and some people just have that, that gift that they are able to give. And it's interesting, it says, He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Now, to me, when I read that, I'm thinking what he's saying is, hey, don't get complicated in it. Keep it simple. Certainly, don't put. we should never have strings attached to our giving. We, you know, we, we pray about it, we let God lead us, and if, if he's telling us to give to someone or give to something, give to that thing, and then I, it's not mine anymore. All right? I've done what God has told me to do. I've given uh, like he's told me to do, and, and now you know, I, I'm going to pray for them that that will go forth and, and prosper. All right? so, so some of us have that, that gift of giving. Uh, uh, then it says, uh, he that ruleth with diligence. My Bible uh, in the commentary says, uh, ruling or leading is the God-given desire, ability, and power to pasture, guide, and oversee the various activities of the church for, spirit, for the spiritual good of all. Someone who, is, who has that gift uh, to ruleth, to, to, um, to organize, to be the administrator of something within the church, says to do it with diligence. You know, what does that mean, uh, to do it with diligence? With diligence means your, your due diligence. If, if that is your gift, to, to be an administrator within the church, to, to be over something in the church, we should, we, there should be diligence there. There should be, a, there should be some thought that goes into it, a, uh, some effort that goes into it so that it is done well uh, so that the things that, you know, if you're in a position, uh, uh, I mean, I think of um, um, Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay Jordan, who takes care on Wednesday nights, you know, the Wednesday night with the children. You know, she's, she's the administrator of that. She's over that. And, and Lindsay takes time and effort to decide how does this need to be done? How does this need to work? And uh, it's interesting, you know, my wife and I, uh, my wife still teaches on, the, on Wednesday nights. And, you know, they're always having to, somebody's having to figure out how to make things work. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, in this COVID, it used to be uh, we, uh, on Wednesday nights, man, they pretty much had the whole, the run of the whole church, you know, and it was, uh, but boy, with COVID, you know, it's, it's, it's limited. And they've, somebody had to take the time to do that due diligence to figure out, all right, this still needs to take place. How can we make this work? And so that's when those people, those administrators within the church, those leaders within the church uh, uh, do that with, with due diligence. And, and as we're reading through this, always remember, okay, where am I in that? You know, as, as some of these, as I read it, I think, well, okay, you know, I, I, I can see myself a little bit in that. Uh, some of them I think, oh, I don't know, God, that's not my gift there, all right? Uh, but that's okay. It's okay that, I, that, you know, they're not all my gift because that's why we're all here. Some of you, it, you're strong in that gift. And so we've got to work together uh, to make these things come together and work. Uh, and then it says, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, my Bible says mercy is the God-given desire, ability, and power to help and comfort those in need or distress. And it says, showeth mercy with cheerfulness. That we should, uh, and, and that's tough. You know, that, that is a God-given gift uh, to have the ability to show mercy to one another, concern for one another, uh, to, to uh, uh, take the time to be concerned about each other. And, you know, that's tough. Uh, I think Brother Kim can tell you, you know, uh, um, in, in talking to people who are in very serious, very difficult times, you know, there are times that people are going through moments in their life and, you know, for me, I tend to think of when I've lost family members, you know, when, when people in my family have passed away. You know, those are moments in your life that, that almost stand still. You know, I look back, you know, in my life, you know, when my dad passed away. And that was a period of time that, that almost stands still to me. You know, I, can, I remember the details of that process and our family going through that, and, and those are difficult. And when you're going through those times, you need those people. And there were those people who came to us and showed mercy and just took care of us. You know, what do you need? Uh, how can I help? And just being, being there to talk to uh, and going through those times. And it says to, to, to show mercy with cheerfulness. Now, that's interesting. That to be able to do it with cheerfulness, to be able to go in there. 
I, I hate to say it this way, but we need, we need those people who can come in at our darkest times and, and be there for us and show mercy to us, but not get so caught up in it that they're not, they lose their cheerfulness. Does that, you know, you've got to have those people. You know, I, I struggle with that. You know, I'm the type, if I get, if, if I'm, if I get involved in that and I'm trying to help somebody out, if I'm not careful, I get so wrapped up in it, I'm, I'm so upset, I'm in bad shape myself, and then I need somebody to help me out, you know? But, but there are those people who can, who, it's just their gift. I mean, they have that ability to come in in those darkest times and be there for us and yet, and yet be cheerful. And that's what, you know, when I, when I think about those times in my life, you know, when people in my life have passed away, those dark times, you know, the, the people who, who were there for me, who did me the most good, were those people who, when I was down and I was dark and I was gloomy, they were cheerful. You know what? They, you, you could tell from being around them, hey, you know what? I'm going to make it. You know, life is going on. Here's this person, and they're coming in there, and life is going on. They're showing me this is going to be okay. I'm going to get through this. So, so we need those people to show mercy, but to be able to do it with cheerfulness. All right, so, so again, so here in, in, in Romans chapter 12, we're looking at a, a, a different set of gifts. And I think Paul, uh, in, in, in three or four different places in the New Testament, when he gives us a list of these gifts, again, He's just giving us, don't, we can't get too caught up in uh, the, those specifics and say, well, I guess if I'm going to have a gift, it's got to be one of these. All right? This is the list. And I, no, there's all kinds of gifts. Just, uh, um, you know, somewhere in the Bible, it talks about the gift of helps. Just last week, somebody was talking to me about uh, Wednesday night. Uh, they were talking about how um, uh, the group that, that, cooks for the kids on Wednesday nights and serves the kids uh, that they could use some help that we don't have enough people you know man that's that is a gift uh, that is a gift of helps where you just come in and you figure out what's going on that I can plug myself into um, uh, I never and Kim you have to help me out I never can remember the guy's name and uh, that you got to find where God's working and plug yourself in Blackaby, yes, man I I, uh, I love that that study and man that was one of those things that just just I mean knock me upside the head that, that you know we spend too much time praying God where do you want me what's my calling what what is my gifts what do you where do you want me what do you want me doing it's what we should be doing is just where's God working what's he doing what are some of the things he's doing and and you'll be drawn to those things those things that you have a gift for you'll be drawn to those things that's just like you know cooking on Wednesday night there are people that, now I don't need to have anything to do with that, all right? Because I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do it just like I do at home. I'll go in there and help, and I'll leave a mess for somebody else to clean up, all right? Because I, anyway, uh, i got some improving to do there, all right? Uh, but there are people who they're just drawn to that. I mean, we have, we have people who come in and, and cook for when there's a funeral or, or something, a visitation, and they take care of those people. There's all kinds of things in the church. I mean, uh, the clean, keeping things clean. It, I mean, we could just sit here and we could go on, on a list after list after list of things that need to be done in this church that, that we should be looking at and saying, uh, hey, where can I plug myself in? You know, where, what am I drawn to? What is the Holy Spirit drawing me to that I can plug myself in and that I can use my gifts? All right, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, we've read this a time or two, but, but, but really I want to wrap up uh, uh, talking about these gifts here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. What are the purpose of of these gifts we can talk about all of these gifts that take place in the church that we need to plug ourselves into what are the purpose of these gifts within the church and Ephesians chapter 4 verses 12 through 16 says this here's what here's what the purpose of these gifts are for the perfecting of the saints now remember last week we said in, in a different version it uses the word for the the equipping of the saints you know that we have a part to play that for the equipping of us so that we can get this get all this stuff done that needs to be taken care of within the church for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for service because that's what we're supposed to be doing as a church serving uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the edifying of the body of Christ the edifying edifying the lifting up the exhorting of the body uh, of Christ which we are a part of verse 13 till we all come in the unity of, of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. A perfect man. That's talking about a, a, a grown up, a mature, functioning, that we're getting the things done that God wants us to do, that we are being the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ uh, as a church. So, so unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they, they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto, in, unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, that's it. it says, but speaking the truth in love. We live in a time, a, a, a current time, where we get that backwards, all right? Now, as, as Christians, we should be speaking the truth in love. Now, first of all, goal number one is that we should be speaking the truth. There are truths in this Bible that are not popular in the world today. But it's not my job to be popular in the world. Nowhere in this book does it tell me that as a Christian that my job is to be popular in the world. Nowhere does it tell me that I'm supposed to uh, that my job is to say things that the world's going to be happy and they're going to pat me on the back. No, what it says is I am to speak the truth. Now, so as Christians, we should be speaking. The, what does the truth, what does the Word of God say? And, and whatever the Word of God says, I'm sorry if that it offends you, if you don't like it, but that's what the Word of God says. I believe every word in this book, and we should be speaking the truth, but speaking the truth now, but speaking the truth in love. All right. Now, that does not mean that we should be taking the Word of God and using it as a hammer uh, to beat each other over the head. All right. uh, it says we've got to speak the truth, but we've got to do it in love. We've got to be concerned, have concern for one another, using the Word of God to say, hey, let's take a look at it. Here's what it says. All right. This is the truth, uh, and, and, and exhorting one another with it. All right. so, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The edifying of the body of Jesus Christ in love. Now, if you'll notice here, anytime he talks about, anytime Paul talks about the, this body, you will notice he talks a lot, a lot about the head. All right? The head is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of this body. Separate from him, we're useless. Uh, uh, everything we do has to be with him as the head of this body. But we are the body. All right? and, and in my body, I have all kinds of parts, and each, each part has a, a different job to do. All right? uh, and, and so as, as members of the, this, this body, this church, this New Testament church, we all need to be thinking about what what is, my, what is my function? What is the gift that, get, that God has given to me? And I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that we need everybody to get up and teach or that we need everybody to get up and preach. Absol there, are, there are hundreds of things within the body of Christ that need to be taken care of. Some of them take place while we're here at church. And some of them take place when we're gone, when we're out, we're out checking on each other and, and, and uh, uh, keeping track of each other, make sure we're doing okay. So there's all kinds of gifts, but that is what the, the church looks like. That is what the, the church is in unity, and yet there's all kinds, there's hundreds of different things that, that people are taking care of, those gifts that are, that are working uh, in, the, in the church. I want to end with this uh, uh, because I think this is important is a good picture of the church and the, the function of the church, and that is uh, uh, the tabernacle. You know, um, uh, several years ago, we did a study of the tabernacle. The taberna a study of the tabernacle is, it might be my, my most favorite study in the Bible, is the study of the tabernacle, that Old Testament tabernacle. You know, I'm talking about when uh, uh, David, and uh, when they come across the Jordan, and they would set up the tabernacle. And it's interesting to study that tabernacle, the structure of it. The, there is not one thing about that tabernacle that is not a picture for us today. It, that tabernacle is a beautiful picture of my, not just my salvation, but my walk as a Christian. It, 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 
is a, just a beautiful picture uh, of the tabernacle. One aspect of the tabernacle is called the holy place. Now, so in, a, in a, the tabernacle, I kind of divide it into three sections. You have that outer court, and that's where the, the altar was, you know, where all the sacrificing took place. And then when you would, when you would leave the, the outer court, you would walk into an area called uh, uh, the holy place. And then past the holy place was the holy of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant and the, the mercy seat, that's where God himself was seated on that mercy seat within that holy place, in the holy of holies. But in that holy place, the holy place was a place where the priest did their work. Now, at, at the, those priests are a picture of you and I. We're New Testament priests. The Bible tells us that we are priests and that we are to be working as priests. So when you go into that holy place, uh, there, there are three uh, pieces of furniture in that holy place that very perfectly describe what our function is. Uh, first of all, you go in there, there is the, the altar of incense sets up there. Now the altar of incense, that was, constantly they were keeping it lit. It was all, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. That altar of incense was lit and it was, it was producing a sweet smelling savor that would go up and it, it, it sat right next to the curtain that led to the, to the Holy of Holies. Why? Because that incense, that was a sweet-smelling savor to, to God as he sat on his throne in, in the Holy of Holies. And what does that represent? It represents prayers. Uh, real quick, go to, go to Acts 12.5. Real quick. I've got to hurry. Acts 12.5. Acts 12.5 says something that it's dealing with prayer, but a specific type of prayer that when we talk about edifying the body of Christ, I think it's very important. Uh, uh, Acts 12.5. Acts 12.5 says this. And, and here's the situation here is Peter's been thrown in jail. All right, Peter's, uh, actually James has been killed and Peter's been thrown in jail. And it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayers was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What was the church? Peter was in prison and what was the church doing? They were, they were praying without ceasing for old Peter. I mean, because that is such an important aspect of, of, of the church today. There should be praying. I mean, praying is the, I, I've heard it said that uh, uh, prayer is the big guns. When we, when we study the armor of God, uh, prayer, uh, that's the big guns. The big artillery is the prayer. That's what should be taking place in the church. So that altar of incense was in there. Uh, then there was a, a thing called the golden candlestick, all right? and that's the menorah. You know, have you ever seen the Jewish, uh, you know, the menorah? That's what that looked like, that, that golden candlestick. Uh, and that golden candlestick, uh, ha it gave off light. It was lit all the time. It, it lit up this holy place. And that's, that is a picture of us today. Uh, I, I'm going to run out of time. I can't get into it but uh, right now. But we've, we've looked at it before that that candlestick, they kept that thing lit. It was what provided the light in that room. And it is a picture for us today as New Testament Christians. We are to be uh, the light to a lost and dying world. That is part of our function. So, so the altar of incense, prayers, uh, praise and worship, that's what we should be doing. And we should be that, that light to a lost and dying world. But there's a third piece of furniture. It's called the table of showbread. And now to me, the table of showbread is really gets into uh, a lot of what we're talking about here, these gifts working, the edifying of the church. The table of showbread was a place, it was a, it was a table, and I think they kept uh, 12 um, uh, what, unleavened breads, you know, uh, the flat bread kind of a thing. And they stayed, the, the priest, it was their job to keep the, to cook these, these breads and to place them on the table of showbread. But it's interesting what took place at the table of showbread. The table of showbread is where the priest would come together and they would get around this table of showbread once a week and they would eat the bread together. And they would fellowship together at this table of showbread. The table of showbread is a picture of the New Testament church that we should be fellowshipping. It, it's, it's the table, the, the, uh, to me, uh, the, the golden candlestick, the, the golden lamp, lamp stand is a picture of what we should be doing out there. That we should be evangelizing, that we should be calling in the lost. But the, the table of showbread is what we should be doing with each other that we should be taking care of each other, that we should be concerned with each other, that we should be fellowshipping, that that is, is very important. Are, are, is it important that we pray? 
that we pray together and that we offer up uh, those prayers and those the, the worship to God? Absolutely. We would say, absolutely it is. I mean, that's a no-brainer. When we talk about the golden, uh, the, 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 the lampstand, would we, if I said, is it important as Christians that we go out and we call in the lost and that we be a light to a lost and dying world? We would say, absolutely. I mean, of course, that's a no-brainer. That's easy. Well, but, but there's a third piece of furniture, and that's this table of showbread. And that's where, as New Testament believers, we, sh- we have to be concerned for one another. And that's something sometimes we forget, all right, that we need to be using our gifts to lift each other up, to edify one another. And, and as we move forward, I'm going to end there, but as we move forward over the next few weeks, as a group, you know, uh, we need to really be looking at that, all right, that application of that is uh, uh, us as a group, not just us as, as uh, part of the, 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 the larger church, but as just a, a small group of believers that we should be doing, that we should be edifying each other. And how do we do that? And how, you know, how can we function together to edify and build each other up? So, so as we move forward, we're going to be looking at those things. What is the church? Not, not just what is the church, but what, what's my part in it and what's our part in it, all right, as, as a group of believers who come together and, and, and take care of each other. All right, so I'm going to stop there, uh, and we'll pick up next week, and we'll be taking a look at some things and, and, and looking at, trying to look at some specifics. You know, things, uh, I, I, last week I, I, I told you a new word, uh, missional. Uh, you know, uh, what is our mission? What are some things as a group, not just that we're coming together and we're studying God's Word uh, each week, but what, what are some missions that, uh, that us as this Sunday school class can come together and say, you know what, we can do that. That's something in this church or in this community that through, the, through Jesus Christ we can function. Well, that can be our mission. We're going to become more and more missional. We're going to work on those things. So I look forward to that. Uh, so come back. Look around. Who's not here? We've got to start. You know, we, gotta, we, we want to grow as a group, uh, and, and we want to we bring in new people. Uh, but at the same time, we want to hang on to the folks we got, all right? We're, each of you, and we're all important, all right? And we need to take care of each other. So let's stop there, and let's have prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we just thank you, God, that uh, once again you have blessed us, you've allowed us to come together uh, as, as New Testament Christians, as, as part of the body, a part of your body. Uh, you've allowed us to come together to read your word, and we just thank you that the Holy Spirit has been here with us and that the Holy Spirit just takes your words off of, out of that Bible and, they, and, and puts it in our hearts and minds, and we just thank you so much for that. Lord, you know that there are, there are prayer requests. The Horrell family, we just lift them up to you today, uh, and we just pray that you will touch them uh, and not only that you will you will touch them but you will send those those exhorters those people to them those people in your name uh, that will exhort them and lift them up and take care of them and just wrap their arms around them and be your arms uh, here on earth and, and we just pray for that God uh, Heavenly Father we pray as always that you go with us into the worship service that you will give brother Kim the words you want him to say and that you will give us the ears to hear the things you want us to hear in Christ's name we pray amen All right. Thanks, everybody.